Well, good morning, everybody, on this great anniversary. 30 years ago today, I was standing on the western side of the wall watching a great chunk of the wall being removed by a crane and then walking across the death strip that you mentioned at the Potsdamer Platz, something completely impossible two days before. And in front of me, there was a rather bemused-looking man in a green uniform who turned out to be the American commandant of Berlin. He seemed very, very bewildered by what was going on. General Haddock, he was called. Um, but this event was not about General Haddock. It was about the East Germans who were liberated. And what was really moving about that day was talking to ordinary East Germans. I remember one of them said to me, you know, it's amazing. People are already standing up straighter. Then he said, you know, people are saying what they really think. Think about that in relation to this conference. And he said, I think the sick will get up from their hospital beds and walk. And another guy said to me he'd been most moved by a handwritten poster that he'd seen which said, only today is the war really over. And you know, that's absolutely right because this moment was actually the moment when the Second World War ended. And with this movement, we, moment, we moved from the post-war world to the post-wall world. And that's what we're in today. We're in the post-wall world, and that world is in crisis, which is what I want to talk about. Our mistake was not that we celebrated this as an extraordinary triumph for freedom, for democracy, for Europe, for the West, for human courage. It was all of those things. Our mistake was to think that this was now going to be the way things are forevermore, that this is the direction that history is going, that this is the new normal. That was the big mistake that we made. Think about the arguments behind the invasion of Iraq or how people responded to the Arab Spring, the expectation that it was going to be like this. That's not what history is like. So the wall I want to invite you to knock down is the wall of determinism, both retrospective determinism, that is to say the temptation to believe that what actually happened somehow had to happen, and determinism in relation to the future. It's a wall of liberalism as a closed system. 30 years on, we see walls going up rather than coming down. Mr. Trump's wall in the south of the United States, Viktor Orban's wall on the frontier between Hungary and Serbia, the tariff walls, the mind walls between different civilizations. 30 years later, we have not a global liberal revolution, but a global anti-liberal counter-revolution. That's where we are at the moment. And for us liberals, liberals in the broadest sense, that's to say people who believe in reason, in facts, in freedom, in civilized and free debate, the challenge is to be self-critical fighters. We have to fight against the demagogues, the prophets of unreason, the nationalists and the populists, the Trumps, the Orbans, the Erdogans, the Farages of the Pens. But at the same time, the essence of true liberalism is to be self-critical, constantly to be interrogating your own beliefs, right? Uh, that's quite a difficult thing to do. I don't think the great soldiers of history were probably terribly self-critical. They just went off there with their guns. But that's what liberal fighters have to do, be self-critical at the same time. So what went wrong with liberalism? I look at this threatening clock here, and I'm going to be very brief. I would say that, just to give you a few indications of things that I think went wrong in this liberalism that became a sort of closed system, right? Number one, liberalism was reduced to a single dimension, economic liberalism. And you know what? A liberalism that is one-dimensional is no liberalism at all. Secondly, within that economic liberalism, 
we developed an out-of-control, globalized, financialized capitalism, which led us into one of the greatest crises of democratic capitalism ever, 2008 onward. Arguably, the financial crisis of 2008 was even bigger than that of 1929. The consequences were not so bad. And levels of inequality not seen for 100 years. But inequality is not just inequality of income and wealth. There is also an inequality of attention and respect. And if you look at the populist parties in Europe, be it AfD or Law and Justice in Poland or Fidesz, you name it, it's as least as much about the inequality of attention and respect as it is about the inequality of income and wealth, right? And now I'm going to say something pretty uncomfortable to this audience, which is one reason we have that feeling of the inequality of attention and respect is we had this great liberal ideal of getting half our people into higher education. And the unintended consequence of that has been to divide our societies 50-50 between those, like most people in this room, I guess, who have higher education, who've globalized, who go off and live in the cities, who like openness and immigration and cosmopolitanism, and the other halves of our societies who feel left behind and disrespected. We, liberal internationalists, spent a lot of the last 30 years worrying about the fate of the other half of the world. And I don't apologize for that for a moment. I myself have written two books, one called Free World, one called Free Speech, which are about bringing the benefits of a free society to other parts of the world. But in doing that, we neglected the other halves of our own societies. Right? So it was not wrong to worry about the other half of the world, but it was wrong to neglect the other half of our societies. And they're now the ones who are answering back. Another mistake we made, and I think Shoshana Zuboff will be talking about this later, remember how the internet was going to set us free? Remember that, everybody? The internet will set you free. It turns out that while it has the great liberating potential, what we are now seeing is that it also has the potential for totalitarian surveillance beyond a Stasi general's wildest dream, right? And we see that now in Xinjiang and in other societies, that potential for totalitarian surveillance. Um, the last thing I want to mention, and of course the list is not complete, is China. Today's China is something we would never have anticipated 30 years ago, but it is as much a product of 1989 as are the fragile democracies of Central and Eastern Europe, because China's communist leaders systematically learnt the lesson from the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in order to avoid those mistakes. And along the way, they created a completely unprecedented system, something none of us could have dreamed of in 1989, which be called, in shorthand, Leninist capitalism. And that's now a great ideological competitor, competitor for Western liberal democratic capitalism. And by the way, since you mentioned Hong Kong, could I just say that I personally, on this 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, am thinking very much of the protesters in Hong Kong. Not the methods of violent protest from a small minority, which I cannot support, but for those millions of people who turned out on the streets for the values of freedom and human rights and democracy and free speech. And in solidarity with them, I would like to raise my right hand, the sign of support, the five fingers for the five demands of the protesters in Hong Kong. And if you feel the same way, do please raise your right hand and show the five fingers for those brave people of Hong Kong who are standing up for the same values that people stood up for in Berlin 30 years ago. Thank you very much. Now, I actually, to finish, am optimistic in the longer term. I think that in the long term, free thinking, open societies, will win this struggle of ideas, but I welcome the com competition, by the way. In German, there's a saying, Konkurrenz belebt das Geschäft. <laughs> competition is good for business. Ideologically and intellectually, too, it's good to have that competition. But what we've got to do, 
is to forget about liberal determinism, which is a contradiction in terms like fried snowballs, not see liberalism as a closed, fixed, rigid ideology as we had it in the 1990s and 2000s, but to understand that as John Stuart Mill and Isaiah Berlin and Karl Popper and Ralph Dahrendorf and others have taught us, liberalism is all about openness, about experimentation, about trial and error, about contestation, about exchanging all and any ideas, may the best idea win in robust civility. And if we do that as we are doing it in this hall today, then ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that in a few years' time, those walls will be falling again. Thank you very much.